Wednesday, June 14th, 2017, uh, Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So uh, this is an early market update. It's quarter to 8 a.m. London. And uh, I'd like, like to talk also uh, about the Bank for International Settlements uh, in relation to uh, an interview that's been going, uh, you know, make becoming quite popular uh, on the internet by uh, Ronald uh, Bernard, a former Dutch uh, financier. Uh, he's made a couple of interviews about the financial system, and I'll talk about that later. Right now, just uh, look at the markets. Uh, gold, 1268.50, up about two. The high's been 1270 overnight, and the low, 1266. Yesterday, we traded down to 1259. Um, silver got hammered yesterday, traded down to around 1670. This morning is doing a little better, 1692 up 10. Uh, stock markets closed at all time highs yesterday, uh, pretty much unchanged this morning, really uh, down, you know, minute. Uh, Dow futures down six points, SP down about two, but uh, nothing huge. Uh, FTSE down 10 at 74.89. Currencies, the pound has rebounded these last couple of days. Continues a little stronger this morning. 127.86 up uh, almost a third of a percent. Euro up uh, 12 pips, 112.22. Dollar yen uh, trading around 110.07 unchanged. Um, that's a, a currency cross we need to keep an eye on, especially with the Fed meeting today and the press conference and the economic forecasts that, that are going to come out from uh, Janet Yellen and the FOMC. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, the dollar-yen will provide the direction for pet precious metals. If the dollar continues to drop against the yen, which it seems to be doing right now, uh, the key levels are going to be, well, 110 here because it's a round number, but uh, looking at the older lows in the previous two months, it's 109.11 and 108.13. Those are the key levels. 108.13 is the low in the dollar versus the yen uh, on April 17th, which was also the 12.95 high in gold. So actually, gold has been kind of uh, outperforming a little bit. Um, uh, the yen, because when we got to 1296 last week in gold, the yen didn't only got down to like 109.11 and not 108.13. I know we've uh, corrected back in gold, but uh, that's how I, I see it right now. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, it's an interesting day for the markets because usually, you know, you get the uh, FOMC and that's all people focus on. But we've got a lot of important data uh, today in the U.S. We've got uh, the CPI data out at 8.30 New York time. We've got retail sales. Uh, so those are big numbers, uh, especially considering, you know, that uh, the U.S. economy and all the other Western economies are based on uh, credit. <laughs> so retail sales is a big part of that. Uh, CPI. Uh, the, the core number which the Fed looks at is expected 0.2 month on month and 1.9 year on year. That's the expectation. Uh, C, uh, the headline CPI expected 0.12%. Uh, let's see, retail sales expected to uh, go up 0.1 on the month uh, for May. So if that core CPI number is, let's say, 0.1, 1.8, that will be, you know, the Fed will still hike, I think, but uh, it could affect their thinking forward, make them a bit more dovish. And that's why it's important to read or to look at the comments and the forecasts that the Fed is making. And also all the commas and, you know, the, the words that come out in the, report, in the forecast today. Uh, you have to compare it to the previous one and the previous uh, press conference. That's what the markets do. If they change a little thing, uh, it could affect the market. So I expect that to be more important than the actual announcement. Uh, you know, well, the announcement will be important, but because they're going to probably most probably hike. But so is the uh, text 
that they come out with and also Yellen's comments and forecasts. Uh, going back to now this uh, Dutch uh, financier, uh, I, I listened to his in first interview a few months ago and now he's come out with the second one. And to be honest, I'm not surprised about any of the things he said. Uh, the second one, I agree with him 100% about the Bank for International Settlements. They are the central bankers' uh, bank. They are the bank for the central banks of the world. Uh, they're based in uh, Basel, Switzerland. Uh, I've looked at the BIS for many years. I've known that they're involved in the gold market up until a few years ago. Uh, their accounts were kept in gold. They've changed that now. I think it's in euros and dollars. I'm not sure which currency exactly. Um, what else? They have diplomatic immunity, uh, all the directors of that bank, uh, and all the head of the major central banks like Yellen and uh, Draghi and uh, Carney, they're all directors of the BIS. So when they travel uh, to Basel, Switzerland, I think they go almost every month for uh, uh, monthly meetings. They're above the law. They don't have to report anything. They have diplomatic passports. And the building in Basel itself is, uh, is like an embassy. So it's like a, it's not, it is in Switzerland physically, but not legally. So <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a little nation state, as Mr. Uh, uh, Bernard said, and they are heavily involved. I think, you know, it's difficult to prove, but, uh, you know, they, they have offices everywhere in the world. I think a few years ago, Zero Hedge covered how uh, they had a, a precious metals desk in Hong Kong. Uh, they're involved in basically uh, managing the major currencies uh, you know, outside, you know, uh, the law, you know, you know, and, and, and they do job and they trade for the major central banks, because if you are the central bankers bank, you know, you're going to do, uh, you're going to operate for them, but you're going to operate above the law. No one can see what you do for them. You know, they, they do have a interesting website and they publish a lot of papers, but they never really talk about their operations. And I know for a fact that a lot of the people that work for the central banks, like Bank of England or Fed, they go and work there at the BIS for a year or two or three. Um, I had an experience. Someone came to view my house years ago um, when we were selling it, and he happened to be coming back from Basel, uh, and he worked for the Bank of England. And I said, oh, do you work for the B did you work for the BIS? And he said, yeah, how do you know? And I said, well, because... If you worked for the Bank of England, you went to Basel, <laughs> and he, he said, yeah, we, we go to work there on, for a few years. I'm still employed by the Bank of England, but we work for, at the Bank for International Settlements. So this bank, I think, is a, uh, uh, an example of uh, utilizing a crisis to create something uh, that seems innocuous and that seems to ha help solve the crisis, but it's actually something completely different. And why do I say that? Well, because the BIS, it says here, you know, uh, on Wikipedia, was created in 1930 by an intergovernmental agreement between Germany, Belgium, France, U UK, Italy, Japan, and the US, and Switzerland. And it opened its doors in 1930. But it says the BIS was originally intended to facilitate reparations imposed on Germany by the Treaty of Versailles after World War I and to act as the trustee for the German government international loan, the young loan that was floated in 1930. The need to establish a dedicated institution for this purpose was suggested in 1929 by the Young Committee and was agreed to in August of that year at a conference at The Hague. So the other thing about the BEC was created to help uh, you know, settle the war debt reparations for World War One, and it's still around. And now it's a, a bank that uh, basically writes the rules for international finance. You know, what's going on? And the other thing it did, though, uh, during World War II, uh, is that uh, you had 
the head of the German Central Bank during World War II, who was a Nazi, you know, by, the, you know, <laughs> indirectly, or maybe he was. And uh, they met with all the American uh, counterpart, the French, you know, all, you know, uh, the British counterpart, and they did business together. Um, it's really strange. It says, at the outbreak of Second World War in September 1939, the BIS Board of Directors, on which the main European central banks were represented, decided that the bank should remain open, but that the duration of the hostilities, for the duration of hostilities, no meeting of the board of directors were to take place and that the bank should remain in a neutral stance in conduct of business. However, as the war dragged on, evidence mounted that the BIS conducted operations that were helpful to the Germans. Also throughout the war, uh, the BIS accepted gold from the German Reichsbank in payments for pre-war obligations linked to the Young Plan. Young plan. This in spite of repeated allied warnings not to accept gold or other assets from Nazi Germany. It later transpired that much of this gold had been looted and subsequently remelted by the Germans from the central banks in occupied ter territories. Some of this remelted gold included gold rings and other items from labor and prison camp victims. Operations conducted by the BIS were viewed with increasing suspicion from London and Washington. The fact that top German top-level German industrialists and advisors sat on the BIS board seemed to provide ample evidence of how the BIS might be used uh, by Hitler throughout the war uh, with the help of American, British, and French banks. So between 1933 and 45, the BIS board of directors included Walter, Walter Funk, a prominent Nazi official, Emil Poul, uh, as well as Hermann Schmidt, the director of IG Farben and Baron von Schroeder, owner of J.H. Stein's bank. So, yeah, it, it's no secret that, uh, and this is from Wikipedia, but it's no secret that, you know, the West, you know, the Allies and the Nazis did business at the BIS. That's what kept the war going. They had to finance the enemy or else there wouldn't be a war. Might sound strange, but I'm sorry, that's what happened. And... I think it was the Norwegian delegation at the Bretton Woods in 44 or after the war. They wanted to shut down the bank because they saw what it was. But um, according to Wikipedia, it says here, the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference recommended the liquidation of the bank for international settlements at the earliest possible moment. Uh, but apparently it was uh, opposed by the British delegation. And who was the head of the British de delegation? That old uh, economist, or mathematician actually, John Maynard Keynes. The man, uh, you know, which uh, Keynes in economics is named after. The man, you know, that whose uh, economic ideas has led to where we're now, you know, a total fiat world with, you know, huge government debts and uh, rampant inflation. That was the guy who, you know, uh, objected. So they kept it open, uh, uh, the BIS. So, yeah, I agree uh, with uh, Mr. Bernard. The BIS is actually uh, a secret world government. Uh, they they're in charge and uh, that's where you know it's like a club for the central banks and the com and the banks that they represent and it's where they can do everything that they're not allowed to do uh, in their national uh, countries it says on e Wikipedia that it's owned by the the CIS is owned by the central banks and we're told that central banks are not private and that they're owned by our governments or by the taxpayers. So why does the BIS, if it's owned by the central banks, why does it have to be secret? And why does it have to be have diplomatic immunity in Switzerland and act as a basically a, a sovereign entity? Why isn't it based, you know, uh, why doesn't it have offices in all the different countries and it respects the rule of law of each country if the central banks are national you know are public and owned by by the taxpayer so that's what i think about it um unfortunately a lot of people never heard of the bank for international settlements 
And uh, it's another example of uh, utilizing a crisis, which was World War I and the reparations, to create something that actually uh, helps. You know, they say, oh, it's to help the crisis, but it has more longer term goals. And it's the same thing that he said about the European Stability Mechanism, the ESM. It was created in 2012, just after the European debt crisis. And it was just supposed to help the crisis, but it's going to be, believe me, maybe in 50 years time, this ESM will be uh, like the European Treasury or something like that. You never know. Or maybe it won't. Maybe people will twig on to these things and wake up. But I, I don't think so. If you ask anyone out there, you know, in the public, if they ever heard of the Bank for International Settlements, I'd say... <laughs> One maybe in a thousand might know, not even. So uh, if you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up, share it far and wide, uh, subscribe to my channel if you haven't yet. That will uh, keep you updated of all my uh, new videos. And you can watch me on steemit.com as well. That's S-T-E-E-M-I-T.com. I'll talk to you later. Bye.